Welcome everyone to the Yoga Therapy Hour. Many of you know that we have a borderline obsession here at the Yoga Therapy Hour with nervous system regulation, nourishment, working with our nervous systems. Even if we can't be regulated, that's okay. We can still learn what these states of high sympathetic activation feel like. And what does it feel like when we go into freeze? What does it feel like when we are actually resting and digesting? And what does it feel like when we feel socially connected to others, but also connected to mother nature or connected to a place deep inside of ourselves? All of this is connected to how your nervous system is working. So we have a mobile app, the Optimal State app for iPhone and for Android that you can go in and just type in Optimal State and you can try it for free that helps you track your nervous system and the states of your nervous system at different times of day, different weeks, different months. It's so helpful and gives you data to show you what's happening in your own nervous system. And then we also have some therapeutic interventions that we give you, depending on what state you're in, ideas of what you could do for breathing, what you could do for meditative focus. And we're going to start having way more live content in the new year. So we'd like to invite you to try that out again on the app stores for your mobile phone. And this discussion that I'm having with Melanie Seacat today is right on track with the nervous system regulation. And she's going to discuss for us her personal story, but also what are the skills and tools and techniques that yoga therapy can help us with in terms of our nervous system. And then she's also been trained in somatic experiencing and what are the things and benefits and skills that you can use from somatic experiencing. Melanie does a great job working with both yoga therapy and somatic experiencing. And we're so happy to have her here today. And now I welcome you to meet Melanie. Welcome to the Yoga Therapy Hour podcast. We hope that you're enjoying this podcast each and every week. In addition to this podcast, Marlisa Sullivan and myself, Amy Wheeler, we are hosting a group inside the Polyvagal Institute. It's a free group where you can learn about yoga, yoga therapy, and polyvagal theory. We'd love to have you come on over there too to enjoy some of that free content. And I'll put the link in the show notes so that you can get over there easily. All right, let's go over and meet our guest for today. Welcome, Melanie. So nice to be with you today. Thank you so much for having me. It's wonderful to be with you. Melanie, where are you speaking with us from? Are you in Arizona? Where are you? I'm in Tucson, Arizona. Mm, wonderful. I always like to to ask that because there may be other people in Tucson or Phoenix that hear this and think, oh, I have a friend. <laughs> yeah. So welcome. Thank you. So Melanie, when I first met you many years ago, the thing that just still stands out in my mind and heart about you is a story you told me right when we first got to know each other. And it was about an accident. And I think that would lead us so beautifully into our discussion today around yoga therapy, yoga, somatic experiencing. So do you know what story I'm talking about? Yes, of course. <laughs> it was uh, <laughs> the most pivotal transformational story of my life. So yeah. Mm. Yes. What happened was I went on a river rafting trip in the Grand Canyon. I was on a hike and it was a rather extreme hike and i fell off a cliff and broke my pelvis mm -hmm. and i had been prior to that i'd been in a lot of adrenal fatigue i was kind of at the age in my early 50s where things were getting wonky and i'd been under a lot of stress at work and you know i think that's what contributed to what happened but i basically fainted on this cliff just fell down 15 feet broke my pelvis and the recovery of that was i ended up going into surgery and I had met a yoga therapist prior to going on this trip. And Can she I was interrupt you for a minute. Yeah. My little mind likes a good story. So yeah. you're rafting 
you hike and fall off a cliff. Did they need to airlift you out of there? I with got held up out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you want to go into all the gory details, I was on a river for four days rafting down a river with a broken pelvis. And then finally, my leg went totally black and they said, you have to get out of here. And so I was in a lot of pain. It was four days later. And then I was rushed, you know, down to Tucson. And, you know, they ended up saying we can operate, but you might have to get a hip replacement. They ended up just operating and putting in two plates and nine screws, but they didn't know if I was going to walk again. You Mm -hmm. know, it was really experimental surgery. They weren't sure I was in the operating room a long time. And so the recovery process was miraculous. And I attribute it to having found this yoga therapist who I had met her like a month or two prior and -hmm. had just started working with her, but she took an interest in my case and really helped me. And she helped me recover. Once I came home, I was bedridden and in a wheelchair. And she said, I can help you prepare for physical therapy. And so she began to give me these yogic tools like breathing practices and movements that didn't involve the hip, but very powerful practices that regulated my nervous system that got me into a much calmer place. I had been traumatized and Mm -hmm. I was in a lot of stress from the surgery and the fall and everything. And it was those practices that allowed my system to get into more equilibrium, get into a place where the healing process, the natural biological healing process could do its job. The surgeons did a good job too. I have to credit them, but they were amazed at how quickly and completely I healed. And that was, you know, almost 14 years ago. And I have gotten a lot of use out of my hips since then. But it was so transformative because it wasn't just the physical healing impact of it. It was actually the deeper state that I got into of clarity. And all of a sudden, I was just seeing patterns in my life on mental, emotional levels, behavioral levels, relationship levels from a whole new vantage point. I had so much more clarity. And it inspired me to want to become a yoga therapist. I just knew at that point, this was something I wanted to be, you know, contribute in the world around and I wanted to continue studying it and learning it. And so really, as soon as I could walk, I got a yoga certification, practiced being a yoga teacher for a year, and then went into the program that you were one of my faculty for. And I was so lucky to be accepted because I was such a newbie. (laughs) Yeah. It's such a powerful story on so many levels, because I think, first of all, I don't hear that many people talking about yoga therapy being used after surgery before PT. Uh, A lot of times we hear people say, Oh, when people graduate from their six or eight weeks or six or eight months of PT, physical therapy, then if they're not ready for regular workouts or something, a yoga therapist can kind of be that intermediate person. But in your case, you were using the subtle tools to regulate your nervous system after surgery and before you could even go into PT. hundred percent. I mean, I think yoga therapy is such a great modality for post-surgery recovery, because the body will do so much to heal itself. We don't have to intervene with all these movements and all this stuff. First, it just needs to heal. And what we know about the nervous system is that we have a branch of the nervous system, the rest digest and heal branch. But when we have been traumatized and stressed from injury and surgery and other things, you know, our system is really out of kilter and there's so much stress going on and that doesn't support the healing process. It sounds really cliche, but that's where that inner healer experience, that empowerment to say, I have an inner healer inside me. I can affect change in my system. I can be, you know, really a part of my healing process. And that was transformative. And that's, I think, one of the gifts of yoga therapy is that it really does offer self-empowering tools to take back our health. Absolutely. Even laying in a bed, feeling broken. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So something else you said, and you don't have to get into specifics, but I think this is fascinating because I've had this happen too. You have an accident. You've been doing your life, backing it full. You're just go, go, go. You have something that happens that stops us in our tracks. Like, no, Mm -hmm. you will not. You know, if you're playing Monopoly and they say you cannot pass go (laughs) and go back 13 steps or something, something happens where we are not allowed to continue on the trajectory that we had thought we were going on. And when you have an illness or an accident like this, 
you basically are stopped and you have to reflect on everything that's happened prior, what's possible now. I remember Gary Kraftso talking about this too, when he had his, I think he had a brain tumor mm-hmm. that he had surgery on and, and that it actually alters the course of our lives going forward. Do you have anything to add about that? Absolutely. Well, I think, you know, this is sort of the root of many philosophical traditions, Buddhism and yoga therapy, and many say that it's through suffering that we evolve, right? Mm -hmm. And the thing is, we have an opportunity to look at the causes of the suffering and to be a part of the healing process when those moments occur. The question is, are we available for that opportunity? And do we take the time? Mm -hmm. And this is where yoga therapy was such a gift. I mean, it was really such a blessing to have this technology that gave me my mind something to focus on other than spinning out, right? And it gave me a way into this state, state management, where things Mm -hmm. could start to shift from the inside out. And so I could have gone to a therapist and talked about everything that happened. And that is something that I did do because both are important. But especially with things like trauma, you know, this inside out approach really got me to not just healing, but also to personal growth and spiritual growth at a much deeper level. I really began to be my own best, like connection to that teachable moment of what really happened here and what are the root causes of this? And I was ready for it. I definitely seized that as an opportunity. But I think that that's the key is recognizing that being ill does not have to mean, you know, we're just identified with the illness. We can actually link to what we have to learn from that and seek the tools. And yoga therapy is one fabulous tool and there's many others. Yeah. And would you say during that time, like were the philosophical teachings of yoga part of your reflection on the spiritual level or did you not know those yet or? Well, they were woven in in a very graceful way. And, you know, it wasn't like, here's what you need to believe in. There's no invitation to have a belief system, but the principles around what we're doing to focus the mind. So the yoga sutras were woven in as an adjunct to the tools and techniques. And so I had these afflictions of my mind. I had these obstacles, you know, these ways in which I was attached to being in a certain way and a certain identity. And when I began to calm my mind, I was then able to hear more clearly what those teachings had to offer me and take them in and say, oh yeah, that is an affliction of my mind. And that is something that I am creating and I'm going to work with that. The yoga philosophy came in at teachable moments and I was very open to it. And it wasn't meant to be a religion. It wasn't meant to be, here's your spiritual path. But, you know, one of the main things that yoga provides that I really adopted for my own sort of spiritual path was this idea that there is something very much eternal inside of us. And it's this Mm -hmm. light, you know, you can look at it as the light, you know, some people say the soul. And it is there and it is connected to something bigger. And we have this life where we have our cultural conditioning, our family conditioning, and we create all of these layers of interpretation and judgment. And that layer of our mind is very muddied. And (laughs) so we're having the world come to us through our senses. We're having all these experiences and we're interpreting it all through this muddy lake mind that is filled with all of these wounds and projections and all of this stuff, all of this junk. And these practices, the light is still there, but it's not shining as brightly as it could. We're not really aware that it's there. So what I found in these practices was a connection to that light. I found that my mind started to calm down, the muddy stuff started to sift downward. And as that light started to shine more brightly, I felt a deeper connection to something inside me that was really peaceful. And it was always there. It also helped me to see more clearly and be sort of like looking at my shadow, my dark side, my patterns, and be more honest about it and be more like, oh, God, there I go again, without judgment, you know, just like I get it now, I get it now, and almost being able to laugh at myself. So it really became a full-fledged spiritual and personal growth and healing path for me. 
I'm in awe of how you're describing this. I think it's so hard to describe what yoga therapy can do because you could piece it apart and do some of that work with a psychologist, mm-hmm. some with a maybe a respiratory therapist, although I don't really think yeah. they teach pranayama, or some with really skillful physio. Like a lot of the tools kind of look the same, but I think what you just said the place that it all comes together is this idea that there's a place inside of me that is untouched by this suffering. And it remains even when there is a big part of me that is suffering. Right. Tune into that. Like that's steep and that that's secular. It doesn't spiritually secular. It doesn't have to be any religion. It could be, it doesn't have to be. It's transcendent of religion or dogma or belief, you know? And it's also experiential. You know, it's not, I'm reading this scripture and I really like what it says, but it's still just at this level of my cognitive brain and that's powerful. And that's one of the steps in the Eightfold Path of Yoga is self-reflection through study of scriptures and the Yoga Sutras come into play. But what was meaningful for me, most meaningful was the experiential aspect of yoga that I got to a place where I tapped into that. And then life started to be totally different for me. Then I walked into the elevator at work where I used to have judgment of the person beside me in the elevator. And I felt empathy, Mm -hmm. kindness. And I felt like there's a human being here. And then, you know, my relationship with my son improved. And then all of a sudden, I am tapped into something where all this stuff is going on that is dramatic and difficult, but I'm still in my center of gravity. I still feel connected to something peaceful. I'm not as influenced and reactive to the world around me. I am really much more grounded and connected to my inner light. And that's not a religion. That's just an experience. And they put words to it. You know, all these religions put words to it, but yoga gave me that experience. And that's what I needed personally to advance my spiritual growth and my personal development. So interesting that you're saying this because we had a class yesterday and one of our teachers, Colleen Carroll, whom you know, brought the students through a beautiful pranayama practice. And afterwards she said, what experience did you have? And a few of them came forward and said, I felt this feeling that I haven't felt before. I don't know what that is. And and it's exactly what you're talking about. And I don't know of any other scope of practice that has the tools and technologies to make it possible for us to get there more often, more regularly. Right. And to do it for ourselves. And so when we're working with a yoga therapist and they give us this sort of multidimensional assessment, and then they develop a personalized, tailored practice. It's mm-hmm. not necessarily asana postures, you know, it's mm-hmm. modified to our needs. There may be mostly postures with breath, or it might be mostly breath work with a little bit of asana. Well, you know, it can be tailored, but what it is, is it's sort of your opportunity then to do that, like brushing your teeth every day. And then something, it's like a homeopathic dose of something shifts that was out of balance. And so it's trying to bring that those elements of your system that are like out of balance, more into balance. So now you're in a new state and you've practiced it and you've had an experience of being in that new state. And then the yoga therapist comes in and says, okay, so where are we now after a week or two a month? That then becomes the progression for the practice. So it's a, it's a course over time approach, right? And this is how we really begin to, in a very titrated, gradual way, start to then, you know, get deeper and deeper into the transformational potential that yoga has to offer. It can be a a three week, you know, experience. It can be a six year experience. It could be you know, a couple months, it doesn't have to be forever, but it has a lot of potential to really be tied to who we are right now and then evolve from there. Yeah. If somehow we could explain this to people, it's like you said, it is something that must be experienced. It's beyond words. I think one of the challenges is that, you know, it does require that we step up and have a practice, right? It requires that we do something. So we can't just passively, you know, it's the gift and the curse of it. You know, we like to just go and say, give me a massage and let me feel better or go and give me some pills and let me feel better. In yoga, they're saying, you know, do something to affect a change and do that over and over and over and over again. And guess what? A new pattern is going to emerge and it's so powerful. 
but it does require some effort. <laughs> and so some people, you know, won't be able to do that and other people will, but it is an opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting you say that because I've talked to Arun Deva, who's an Ayurvedic practitioner. And he says that Ayurveda was supposed to be the preparation to get people, which is a more passive modality, to get people ready to do a yoga practice, which is much more self-empowered. But a lot of people needed Ayurveda to get their system to a place where they could actually take on a daily practice. Yes. But I think that's the beauty of yoga therapy. And with so many skilled yoga therapists, thanks to your school, as well as other schools, the tailoring of the practice, like I did a short 10 minute practice in bed three times a day when I was really, really in bad shape, in pain, traumatized, fearful. And so I could do that. I could do 10 minutes three times a day. And of course, the motivation was there because I really wanted to heal. But it doesn't have to be this big, long, hour-long practice. Right. It doesn't have to be like that to really be effective. Yeah. Oh, I just want to stop for a moment. You have articulated this so beautifully, Melanie. Like I haven't heard you speak of it this clearly and concisely. And I just want to take it in for a moment. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you for asking me to tell my story. It's a lived experience, so it's easy to talk about. And I'm so so passionate about it. It's just been a guiding light in my life. It's just been so helpful. The Optimal State has some really exciting news for 2024. I'm moving to Minnesota, and as a result, I have the opportunity to come together with the University of Minnesota Buchan Center for Spirituality and offer therapeutic yoga classes to the general public, the employees of the university, and their families. We will do a three-part series in 2024, and we'd love for you to join us and become part of our University of Minnesota community, whether you're doing it for yourself or your loved ones, or you're doing it for continuing education. This is an online program that we're offering three times in 2024. And if you want more information, please come to www.theoptimalstate.com and look on the website for a section that talks about the University of Minnesota. We're so happy to be joining forces, and we wanted to share our excitement with you so that you would have an opportunity to join us too. All right, back to our programming. So after you did heal, you said you made a full and complete recovery, and we know you're an avid hiker that can go for days and days on backpack trips, which is also so inspiring. I mean, I think many people would think if you fell off a cliff and broke your pelvis and your leg turned black and... (laughs) Like, I don't think they would realize what a full and complete recovery could look like. It is pretty miraculous, actually, that I got to back to the level that I got back to. I mean, of course, with a trauma like that, you don't have the same range of motion and there's weakness and you have to keep, you know, strengthening. But I've been able to live my best life. You know, I've been able to do all the things that I like to do. I don't run trails anymore, but other than that, Mm -hmm. I'm very active. So It's been quite remarkable. Wow. Let's move to you healed. Things are better in life. You're living your best life. What does yoga therapy do for you now? Are you still doing a practice every day or have you switched more towards somatic experiencing? I do a yoga practice almost daily. You know, I'm not going to lie. I don't make it every day. But no, yoga is still absolutely central to my life. And my practice as a yoga therapist has integrated this other modality called somatic experiencing that I'm very excited to share with you. Somatic experiencing is like yoga therapy. It's a body-based method and it's a psychotherapeutic method for addressing trauma and resolving trauma. And it resolves it through the nervous system and through the body. And so somatic means body-based and experiencing is experiencing the body in the present moment. And the idea with somatic experiencing is that you're really tapping into and tracking your nervous system states. I integrate those two now. Somatic experiencing, I'll tell you a little bit about what it is in a moment, but basically what's changed is that I work with people and I meet them where they are. And, you know, we might start with yoga therapy, but then the somatic experiencing approach is just embedded in what I do. And that's more of a 
organic approach, a spontaneous approach to seeing what does the nervous system want to present. And the nervous system, you know, there's different components of our experience. And so when I say the nervous system, there are different nervous system states. And the nervous system states that I'm talking about include the, you know, survival states of fight and flight and freeze. And then there's a nervous system state, which Stephen Porges, this famous guy that you've talked about a lot, who developed the polyvagal theory, which somatic experiencing is a clinical application of polyvagal theory. There's this middle state, which is like the safety zone, where we're not in survival and defensive strategies. We're actually in homeostasis or equilibrium. We have both sympathetic arousal and activation available in that state, but at a moderate level. And we have more parasympathetic or the deactivation part of the sympathetic, you know, where we rest, digest, and heal, we have that available, but these things are cycling. There's this oscillation going and it's fluid and it's rhythmic. And when there's trauma, there's this rupture of getting out of that state and getting into a very high defensive mode. And what Peter Levine did was he basically studied stress physiology and biomedical physics and animals in the wild and psychology. And he integrated all of this over many, many years, multiple disciplines. And he came up with this methodology and it's been in place for 50 years. And it really is one of the key contributions is that animals in the wild typically don't get traumatized, right? And so he got curious about that. Why do animals in the wild not get traumatized? And it's because what he found is that animals will automatically regulate those survival responses. So if they are going into this huge arousal of energy to defend themselves, once they're safe, then they will discharge that. And it will be discharged automatically through Mm -hmm. their autonomic nervous system. It's a primitive part of our brain, an instinctual part of our brain, and it involves shaking and trembling and deep breaths and maybe sweating and all of these things. And it just happens. And then they return to equilibrium. And that human beings have the same, we're also mammals and we have the same Mm -hmm. mechanism built into us, but we also have a very evolved, fancy brain, the neocortex. And this, in circumstances where there's trauma, this can be a problem because the neocortex will override those instinctual responses. Why? Because it's really scary to feel those intense emotions and those intense bodily sensations because we have conditioning, cultural conditioning, judgments, you know, all of this comes into play through our neocortex. And so we inhibit that natural discharge. And when that discharge isn't restored, you know, the animal or the organism will then drop into this another level, which is the freeze response. And there's different levels of the freeze response, which is this shutdown. Mm -hmm. And that shutdown actually is where the bound energy of the survival energy is still in the body. It's like the gas pedal was on and then the brake went on and that creates bound energy in the body. And that's why there's all these trauma symptoms. You know, we're talking about anxiety, depression, PTSD, disruptions to sleep, to the cardiac, respiratory, you know, all of these symptoms start to come up and they're rooted in this initial inability to resolve the trauma. And so what somatic experiencing is, is a methodology to really work at the level of understanding these nervous system states and to very gradually unwind that stuck energy with the client. I mean, clients don't understand that they are in their nervous system pressing the gas and the brake at the same time. They just know they have chronic pain or they know that they're stuck in freeze mode or they know that they are getting chronic illness. Do you tell them like kind of the theory of what you're doing with them or do you just do the work and they feel better? One of the things about somatic experiencing is it's really an emerge, they call it emergent property therapy. So it's very spontaneous in the moment. And so somebody will come in and if there's an initial session, there's some psych education about how we're working, what the modality is, what these nervous system states are, and that, you know, the preparation for being able to work spontaneously with the nervous system and not just create states of calm and ease, but also allow that underlying energy to come up and be felt and experienced in a safe way so it can unwind and discharge, there is a prerequisite to that. And Mm -hmm. the prerequisite is that there's this foundation in stability. There's an anchor where they have a felt sense of something that is more 
calm and at ease, more expanded and less contracted. And so, you know, once there's some initial education, what happens is there's this present moment, you know, experience of they come in and there might be a conversation, right? Mm -hmm. And they might start telling a story and there might be a lot of negative, scary things that they're telling. They're telling their trauma story or something bad because with trauma, there is a bias towards negativity. There's a bias towards what's Mm -hmm. wrong out there. There's this hypervigilance. And so it's very common for that to take place. And so to get to the prerequisite of more common ease, one of the first spontaneous things a therapist might do is really listen carefully and provide empathy, but also get curious about where is there a positive aspect to the story? Where was the resource that got them through it? Mm -hmm. Where did they get help outside themselves or inside themselves? And starting to tease that out and get curious about it and have them think about it, what they're linking to in their mind by talking about their strength and their resource will also have an effect in their body. So we're also working not just with the body, but whatever's showing up. It might be in the conversation. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I love about Stephen Levine is he likes to tell things in sort of metaphorical ways. So he comes from all of this really intense scientific background. You know, like I say, it's neuroscience based. And so he was a researcher. He collaborated with other neuroscientists, Stephen Porges and Bessel van der Kolk, who are well known and are aligned with his approach. And he came up with this method and it looks kind of woo woo. It's like, we're just going to track this activation and deactivation and we're going to release it. And then you're going to establish this, you know, healing place. And not everybody's going to really buy into that, but the proof is in the pudding. It actually works really well. But bottom line is that as a trainee, one of the metaphors that really landed for me that helped me kind of understand it and understand that, and I know it's not woo woo, but it sounds that way when I tell it, is the stream of life metaphor. And his metaphor, which is rooted in neuroscience, is that if we think of life as a stream, and we are flowing along this stream and we're having these experiences. There are boulders in the stream, there are twists and turns in the stream, and those are simply the life experiences that shape us, right? We all have them. And if we're in the stream of life, we can manage those obstacles. And we have a story that is past, present, and future. And we're in the flow of our life. There is flow there, right? That's one of the key things. And there are these protective banks, these levees on the banks of the stream that, you know, really protect us when something scary happens, you know, they kind of keep us contained in this stream of life. But sometimes life presents things that overwhelm us. They come on suddenly They come on with intensity and they rupture that safe boundary. And when that safe levy is ruptured, there's a swirl of what he calls the trauma vortex. It's this big, huge, massive amount of arousal energy. That's the defensive response, right? And that's where things are out of control. There's overwhelm. There's a lot of fear. And in that chaotic place, there's also still available, and this gets back to yoga therapy, the Purusha idea, right? He calls it the healing vortex or the counter vortex that's still there. And so that gets smaller as that gets bigger. But the idea is that we have to grow and get back in touch with that resource, that healing vortex, whatever it is for the person, whatever access they have to that and grow that like a cooking a pot of carrots, you know, there's a very small pot of water, you can only cook a few carrots. But if you want to cook your carrots, you have to grow that pot, you have to be able to have a really big resource pot of healing energy of really stabilization, and it's access to something that is more stable, then you can begin to envelop that trauma vortex and let it dissipate and come back and reintegrate with the stream of life. But that trauma vortex is a lot of fixed, fragmented, psychic energy. And that fixation, that stuck energy is what we're working with. And it has to be done so slowly and carefully because Mm -hmm. the release of that can happen too suddenly and it can re-traumatize a person. So a lot of the training is how do you actually work with that you know, you develop the healing vortex, right? And this is where I brought in the yoga therapy approach because I've worked in addiction centers. I've worked in trauma recovery centers and people are coming in and they're so out of regulation. They're so highly disorganized in their nervous system that just sitting across from them and trying to surf these waves where they can get a little deactivated and then let some activation come up. That's actually takes some work. 
Yeah. <laughs> in preparation. And I have found yoga therapy is just magic for that. I mean, we have the technology in yoga therapy to stabilize people like nobody's business. That is a real mm-hmm. house. And somatic experiencing has its tools. I'm not denigrating anything about somatic experiencing and its approach, but we have the breath. We have the ability to meet a nervous system that's in high activation and just use these big movements of the limb with our mind connected to our breath that takes the mind out of the hypervigilance into mental focus, directing that mind somewhere with the breath getting regulated. This is a magical triangulation of body, breath, and mind that is just super, super powerful. If I didn't have those tools, I know that I would not have been anywhere near as effective in just the somatic experiencing modality alone in in these contexts where people are highly traumatized. So the two do go well together, but they are very different. They are different methodologies, but they combine well together. And they actually rely on a lot of similarities. So just such a lovely combination. And I know people that you've worked with that have said like, wow, I now know after working with Melanie, how to get myself out of breezy business, as you say. Yeah. Is that the eventual goal that they would be self-empowered to have the tools to use when they go into free state or when they go into high sympathetic activation that they could do that at home for themselves? Yes. But I would say that's one of the differences between yoga therapy and somatic experiencing is You know, I do offer short little things that they can do. One of the invitations is to, you know, give them homework to start tracking their nervous system state. One of the things they can do is journal about it. You know, what were the thoughts? What did you want to do? Did you notice any bodily sensations? Did you have any emotions come up? And then if something comes on suddenly, you know, giving them one or two things they can do, like sun salutation at the wall or just sliding their hands up the wall or going up on their toes can meet high activation in the fight flight realm, right? Mm. And then, you know, this orientation to the environment is really good because image is a really good channel of experience for people in freeze because going internally into their bodily sensations usually isn't online for them when they're in deep. So yes, I do give them short things to do, but it's different in yoga therapy. In yoga therapy, it's much more empowering, I think, Mm -hmm. because you're really working with them to try on a practice. It doesn't have to be a very long one, but it combines different tools that can have a real strong effect on their nervous system, on their state that then, you know, really starts to create that foundation of much more stability. And so I will sometimes work with somebody in a yoga therapy context and give them a practice. And then a few sessions later, they want, and we work with somatic experiencing. And now Mm -hmm. they have this ability to access an anchor of stability. And that creates the safety where if the weight to see what the nervous, so this idea of oscillation, and I forgot to mention this when I talked about the stream of life, is that what goes up wants to come back down, what goes down wants to come back up. So when we get that fluidity going and you get them stabilized, something's going to come up. Mm -hmm. And somatic experiencing, we're just doing the spontaneous, what's happening now, what's coming up, working with the client to see it. Mm -hmm. And so you can bring in that slowing things down to be present to if it's an activation, Bringing in clinical mindfulness is what we do in somatic experiencing to say, let's explore this a little bit. Let's slow down and get curious about it. So they have access to this expanded feeling in their lower body, let's hypothetically say, but then something happens where they feel this, you know, tension happening in their right shoulder. So can you take a moment and just be with that tension? And so then this idea of then bringing in pendulation, which is hanging out with the tension, watching it, observing it, seeing what happens next. And does it increase when there's a little bit of stability, tension might show up or some activation might show up and it might start to increase, or it might actually be that stabilization just gets bigger and bigger and goes global. And so Mm -hmm. that would be a measure of resilience, right? The stabilization starts to go global and then they really rest in that. And that creates, you know, a nice integration. But if they start to feel some activation, do they have enough stability that they can just let that move on its own without stopping it? So we don't fuss with it. We let it move on its own. And then we cycle back. And the deactivation is the most important part. They come back down to their stability and they stay there for a while. That's where the integration happens. And Mm -hmm. so that's the resolution model, right? And so I bring the 
evolution model into yoga therapy because we're doing a practice and then we pause and we take a longer pause. Sometimes we always pause in yoga therapy between the asanas, which is a really important piece of how it's becoming a digestion piece. And it actually can result in trauma resolution on its own just by pausing. But I will extend those pauses to really explore what's happening in the nervous system. Yeah. Yeah. We're getting close to the end, but I think this idea yeah. of resolution is such right. an important idea. I'm experiencing it right now in my life. Are Can you? Explain what that means to people, because until you hear that, you don't understand, oh, I could actually have growth mindset and benefit from my trauma. Right. Yeah. So with somatic experiencing, it's a trauma resolution model. And that is just exactly kind of what I just described, which is you have this sandwich of let's orient to the environment. Let's then orient to what's pleasant in the body. Let's get stabilized to what's pleasant here instead of just all of these four alarm fires going off. Let's stabilize that. And that can take a period of time. Mm -hmm. Then you wait and see what happens. And maybe Usually there's some activation that's going to show up, but what we're trained to do in somatic experiencing is titrate that very, very carefully. So the littlest level of activation, we pause and we work with that and then we let it complete and discharge. And then we come back to the stabilization, come back through orientation to pleasure in the body, orientation to the environment, pleasant chit chat, social engagement, which is the ventral vagal nerve and polyvagal theory. That's that middle zone of safety. And you stay there for as long as you can, because that's where the integration happens. You're taking a little bit of that fragmented energy, letting it work, letting it move, and then coming back and integrating it and stabilizing. And then when you do that, the next level will bump up. So then there might be more energy that comes up. And you have to be very careful about how you titrate that. And I'll give an example. So I was working with a client and she got very stable and then she had this gurgling in the stomach. Well, that was a low level activation. That was digestion. (laughs) Mm. She was digesting. We don't have to label what she was digesting. It was just that was happening. And so she could feel that. But then she got this icy stabbing feeling in her back, Mm. that high activation. So I didn't want her to go there for fear it might escalate. And then we would have lost this nice rhythmic cycle we were going for. So I said, would it be okay to stay with your gurgling in the stomach? And she said, yes. And so she was able to hang out with that and let it actually move through her and then come back and calm it down. The IC then became in the background. Then we pendulated her attention back to the IC. Then she was resourced in the gurgling and that had moved through and she had more ability to actually hang out with the IC without it escalating and letting that piece kind of gradually dissipate and resolve. And so we went from one level in one session right to another level and it was successfully renegotiated and completed. But if it's not renegotiated and completed, that's not resolution. And so that's how we're working. Mm -hmm. And could even be a further imprint on the nervous system of the trauma. I mean, I think that's the piece that's so interesting to me is that if we can stay safe enough, long enough while digesting and processing and and let that cycle come to full closure, as you said, you bump up to a different level of stability as opposed to if you just end in fight or flight, you might have actually imprinted into the nervous system trauma all over again. Yep, 100%. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. Luckily, yoga therapy is equally focused on titration and the gradual Mm -hmm. stepwise approach. And, you know, it's also very careful not to land people in that highly activated state. They both are, like you said, practical examples and experiences of polyvagal theory. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, Melanie, is there anything else you would like to add that we didn't get to today? Or do you feel complete? I feel complete. Yeah. Unless you have any questions. No, I think this has been fantastic. And I think we're going to see some somatic experiencing people come over and want to explore yoga therapy and yoga therapy people wanting to explore somatic experiencing. I hope so. And I'd be happy to talk to anyone that wants to talk about that if they're interested in how to combine those two or, you know, what yoga therapy is. So Thank you so, so much. It's been a pleasure to have you here today. And thank you for sharing your story with us. That was really, really powerful. Thank you so much, Amy. Thank you for all you do. And thank you for Mm -hmm. having me. 
I want to thank Melanie for being here with us today. This whole idea of nervous system regulation and discharging trauma from the nervous system and learning how to work with your own nervous system is so fascinating. Some of you know that Marlisa Sullivan and myself give a course through the Polyvagal Institute on just this. It's a seven-week course, and it's starting again October 11th. If you're hearing this before October 11th, you can go to www.polyvagalinstitute.org and find it under courses. You'll see our photos. And if you want to work one-on-one and get more information from Melanie, you can go to CCAT Somatic Therapy, S-E-A-C-A-T Somatic Therapy.com, Integrative Therapy for Healing and Thriving with Melanie CCAT. Such a beautiful website here. And she said she is open to receiving private clients. So whether you just want to know more about somatic experiencing and yoga therapy, you could schedule a session to be educated, or maybe you yourself would like to work with her online. And I know her work can be done online. So, all right, everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure to be with you and we'll see you soon. Thank you for listening to the Yoga Therapy Hour podcast. We want to remind you that you can always go over to YouTube and see the video versions of almost all the podcasts. However, we do reserve the most recent video production for our Patreon members. Our Patreon members help to support this podcast, and we'd love to invite you to be part of that community also. They get free gifts every week yoga nidras, and all the newest content before it comes over to YouTube. So find us on Patreon. It's The Yoga Therapy Hour and Optimal State, and we'd love to have you support the show. A special thank you to our team here at Optimal State. We are truly a global family. George Mantuan, one of our executive producers. Adam Satchel, senior media producer and sound engineer from the Philippines. Krishna Panchal, a producer from Canada. Modupe Abdullahi, who does the show notes and is an editor for us from Nigeria. And Peter Morley, who wrote and produced the music for this show, who lives in Australia. Find more about Peter's work at www.zenmusic.biz. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.